I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land glory. This morning's lesson is entitled Overcoming the World. The text comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. There's just, just a point right here. The, the idea of believeth is more than just a, a mental affirmation of something, uh, of something you believe. It also includes the actions that follow from that belief. So just affirming Jesus is the Christ, Son, living God, does it mean you're born again unless and until you do all those other things that are involved with it also? Verse 2 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. There it goes back to that believing thing. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For, whosoever, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And the faith that flows from that. Now, in the Navy, we had a phrase, what are the bennies? What are the benefits? What do I get out of it? It was a popular question. And uh, what's in it for me? That's, a, that's, you know, what's the return on my investment? That's a very, very uh, important thing. A salesman, when he's selling a piece of equipment, and the farmer says, well, wh why should I buy this over that? And you, you go through all the process, and finally you just say, well, when you buy this, you get me. Okay, that's, sometimes that's the selling point. So what, what are the benefits? These are some of the first questions to be asked in determining the cost of discipleship. In Luke chapter 24, uh, it, it, it depicts the, the uh, Jesus asking, they're talking about, um, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So it's the idea of taking up the cross, that there are some things involved with this. It's not that we hate. The word hate there that Jesus uses in Luke 14, 26 is, is loving less. You know, which do you love more? Do you love your family, all your belongings more than me? Do you love your own life more than me? And what, whosoever does not take his, does, doth not bear his cross. The burdens that you, bear, that you bear in your life. Verse 28 talks about counting the cost. You know, when, when, a builder sit, when a person wants to build a house or a structure, they figure out what it's going to cost them. You know, this is what I want. They go to the architect and say, this is what I want it to be. And the architect says, okay, well, this is what that's going to cost you. You may, not, you may say, well, you know, maybe we should cut back on a few of these things. And it goes on in verse 31, it says, What king goeth to make war against another king? And he, and he sits down and figures out whether I can beat this guy or not. He thinks about it. He considers it. Verse 33, So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, cannot be my disciple. What are you willing to give up to become a disciple of Christ? That's the question. That's what he's asking here. That's, that's what's going on in this particular passage. We have to ask these things. We have to determine the cost. Somebody may sit down and say, you know what? I want the short-term gain over the long-term gain. Long-term gain. That's short-sighted to say the least because their life could be taken from them tonight. The rich farmer said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And the Lord said, Thou fool, tonight shall thy soul be required of thee. So we don't have dinner time. We've got right now. Our life is right here and right now. So this is how we ought to live. But, of course, for the faithful disciple of Christ, heaven is the ultimate gracious benefit offered by God. Colossians 1.5, the hope of heaven that you heard before in the truth of the gospel. So what's in it for me? It's, as we sang that hymn just a moment ago, walking the streets of gold. That's what it is. Now, will there be streets in heaven and will they be paved with gold? Probably not. But if you wanted to describe a really, really luxurious city to somebody, how would you describe it? Streets of gold. Paving stone of gold. Man, that's something. But that's the image. So overcoming seems like a pretty serious operation. When you, when you think about this idea of overcoming the world... To gain heaven, it ought to come across as something very serious. In Revelation chapter 21, 
We're just going to look at verses 7 and 8. Where Jesus says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So note especially the four things that are mentioned here. And verse 7 talks about overcoming and inheriting. Well, what am I, and, 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 and God being our God and our sonship, you know, what's in it for me? I'm going to be a son of God. Imagine you know, we lived in another place. The mayor had a son that loved his fast car. And the police officers in that town learned that you don't pull over the, the mayor's son and give him a ticket. You don't do it. You might do it the first time, but you won't do it the second time. You might. You may not have a job. Well, that's doesn't matter whether it's fair or not. That's just the way it was. Well, there's a benefit being the mayor's son in that particular city, city at that particular time. There is a benefit to us being a son of God. There's a huge benefit for us being a son of God. The word overcometh is the clash of the believer with sin in the world. John talks at first in First John. Two, John talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. How do we overcome that? How do we beat that? How do we beat the natural tendency of mankind to want the comfort that here and now that can be had in the here and now? How do we overcome that? You know, what we're talking about is adult, becoming an adult, delayed gratification. We get up every Monday morning, we put on our work clothes, we go to work, and Friday after and Friday as we leave work, we get a paycheck. Why do we go to work Monday through Friday afternoon? To get that paycheck. Heard the story of a fellow up in a car line up in Detroit. He would only work through, through Wednesday. Thursday and Friday, he wouldn't work. And the uh, plant manager happened to be coming through one time. The district manager was, was actually coming through the plant one time. And they saw this fellow standing over there. It's a Wednesday afternoon. Why do you only work Monday through Wednesday? He said, because I can't make it on Monday and Tuesday. You know, what's in it for me? There's a benefit. There's something to be had in all of this. But overcoming the clash, a desire, it also involves a desire and a thirst for salvation and righteousness. Do I want later on more than I want right here and now? Matthew 5, 6 talks about hungry and thirsting after righteousness shall be filled. Shall be filled. If I, and, and this is something that is, that is typical of human beings, Whatever it is we want, whatever it is we attach value to, that's what we will really focus on and try to acquire. I don't care what it is. You might want a new pair of shoes. You might want a particular new pair of shoes. You might want a particular kind of car. Whatever it is you want and you decide, you know, I really want that. Well, what are you willing to give up to get that? And it's like Monday through Friday. We give up 40 hours a week. If you're lucky, might be less, might be more. But we give up 40 hours a week to get that paycheck at the end of the week. We might, as a salesperson, we might make four or five or six more phone calls today because I want to reach a particular sales goal. So it depends on what we want and how hard we're willing to work for it. But he talks about inheriting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Jesus, or Paul says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Now, Jesus created this universe. He was the, he was the you know, uh, what, John chapter, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and so forth. Jesus was that power, and he created all of this. He is heir of all of this. He's inheriting all of it. And if I'm a fellow heir, then I'm going to inherit it also. Now, we can get into discussion some other time about how that exactly works. But all this is mine, in a sense, in a manner of speaking. For God, it mentions God. Thinking, uh, think of all the blessings he has to give. Why would I want to be a son of God? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, Moses is speaking to the nation of Israel. He's gathered them all together. And he is literally just hours away from his impending death, and he's, and he's talking to them one last time. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2 through 14, he is listing all of the blessings 
that God will give to the nation of Israel if they remain faithful. And then in verse, I think it's verse, well, it begins in verse 15. I think, I think it's about 68 more verses, or the end of the chapter is about verse 68. He lists all the curses that will befall the nation of Israel if they're not faithful. Now, if you look at that list of blessings and then you compare it to the cursings, why would that be a hard decision? Why, why would that be a hard decision at all? Well, apparently it was for them. They gave in to the flesh. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, or in places in Christ. So if I'm in Christ and all spiritual blessings are in Christ, then I am where all spiritual blessings exist. And if I am there where they are, and I am a son of God, and I inherit the blessings of God, then I'm going to get those blessings in one shape, form, or another. I think that's a pretty good deal. Um, one of them is, is I don't have to fear death as a child. Now, whenever I say that, I, I always hasten to add, does it make me nervous? Oh, absolutely. Aren't you a child of God? Yes, I'm a child of God, but I've never died before. I don't know what it feels like. Just say it. So, and I also can't imagine that the actual thing itself is going to be painful or anything, but again, I, I don't know. I'm not talking about the process that gets you there. I'm talking about the thing itself. But if the angels are on the other side to carry my faithful spirit to the bosom of Abraham, why would I fear that? Well, I, I shouldn't. You know, you know why we fear? It's because we lack faith in ourselves. We doubt ourselves. Again, that's another lesson I'm, I've got in mind to preach. We'll talk about it then in more depth. The idea of sonship. I am a son of God. Um, 1 John chapter 3. Um, let's see. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I'll turn over to it. He says this. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It nailed Jesus to the cross. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, future tense. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm going to be like Jesus is. What does that mean? Note verse 3. And every man that hath this hope, seeing Jesus as Jesus is, hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. So one of the benefits of this life is giving us the opportunity to purify ourselves as Jesus is pure. Now right there, right there, is why people become nervous because they know that they're not as pure as Jesus was. Now, Peter says, first, 2 Peter chapter 1, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, we're not going to be that because God is infinitely holy and we're not. We're finite. We can't get there. But what's he mean? That's what you shoot for. I press towards the prize of the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. That's what Paul says. That's the point. It's the journey for me to get from where I am to where God wants me to be as a, in a, moral, in a, a morally pure sense. So I have to work at this. I have to put effort in, make your, make your calling and election sure, give diligence, and so forth. So I have to put some effort into being what God wants me to be. And will I ever get to where God would prefer me? No. Why? Because I'm a human being and God's desires are perfect. That's what the grace of God is all about. And we'll look at that here in just a moment, too. It's the idea that God's grace covers my human, short, human shortcomings, my fail, human failings, because I cannot get to where God wants me to be, because he wants me to be as he is, and that's something I can't do. But observe those with whom the overcomer is contrasted in verse 8. It was just, I read it for you just a moment ago, but look at it again. Look, look at who... The overcomer, when you overcome, look at who's on the other side of that thing. The fearful, verse 8, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, hormones. 
Those are the unbelievers. Those are the ones that never even start to begin to get with the program. They don't even start the journey. These are the ones that do not overcome. These are the ones that are not in Christ. That are not where spiritual blessings and heavenly places are. So each... And, and consider then that each of the other Asian churches were told to overcome. And I listed the, pla the places there in, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 where the various churches were told to overcome. He that overcometh. Says that, what, about seven times? Two, four, six, yep, seven times. He says, overcome. How do you do that? That's the point. That's the point of this lesson. But what is it that is overcome specifically? You know, I, I'm a big believer in rules. If, if, you're, if we're going to play a game or if we're going to engage in an activity of one sort or another and there's a goal in mind and there are rules or stipulations or requirements or specifications, I want to know what they are as we plan this journey. Let's sit down and count the cost. What's it going to take to get from here to there, wherever that, whatever that process is, wherever there is. And once I know what the rules are and what the specifications are, you know, you give me the rule book, you give me the instruction sheet, whatever. And that's what we're going to do. Don't change it in the middle of the road without telling me and hold me accountable. So once, once I know what the rules of the game are, then okay, game on. So God has said... Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be as holy as I am holy. Well, all right, how do I do that? He says, here, here's the rule book. Sit down and read it and study it and apply it and become that. That's the way it works. So notice this, what we overcome. And, and that's also another thing that is to know what you don't want. Lust of the heart and the mind, Matthew chapter 15. But those things which proceed out of the mouth Come forth from the heart. Man, I shouldn't have said that. All right? You let somebody talk long enough, they'll tell you what they really think. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart, the mind, the emotional context of, of a human being, proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. Think, think Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not the man. Ephesians chapter 2. We're in a time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by course of action, by force of habit, the children of wrath, even as others. Think Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. See, this, I have to overcome me. I, my, my biggest opponent, my biggest stumbling block is me. Not you, not them, not anybody else, but me. I have to conquer me. How do you do that? That's the question. And when these things are acted upon, you see it in Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32. Go, don't look at it now, but later on, look at Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, and you see the consequence of a, of a fleshly mindset. A person that doesn't care what God thinks. Not interested in what God... Luke chapter 8, verse 11, behold, uh, no, it's verse 12. The sower went forth to sow, and he sowed the seed, and the wayside, some fell in the wayside soil. Okay, that's them. That's who we're talking about right here. Um, James chapter 1, verses 12, uh, 12 through 15. Uh, let's see. James chapter 1, he says this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Who are those that love him that keep his commandments? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Why did God do this to me? Who said he did? And how, if he, how do you know that he did? Well, I, I know what they're saying. They're saying God is all powerful and sovereign. If anything happens, it happens according to his will. Um, God doesn't tempt any man. For God cannot tempt, be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. 
Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Let my people go. Who is Jehovah that I should listen to him? See what happened to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was given the opportunity. He didn't take it. Failed miserably, as a matter of fact. The biggest part of his nation died. His own son died because of his haughty heart. It might just be lack of spiritual maturity. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul discussing uh, what his teachings were and what he wanted to say to the Corinthian brethren, he said, I have many more things to tell you, but I can't tell you because of your spiritual immaturity, because, you're, because you are yet carnal, is what he says in the King James. So he's telling, the, Philipp, he's telling the, the Corinthian church members, members of the church, washed in the blood of the Lamb, ye are yet carnal. In other words, you are still yet babes in Christ. You should have grown up by now. That's what Hebrews 5.12 says. By reason of time, you ought to be teachers. How do you know when somebody is spiritually mature? They're able to teach others. Well, somebody says, well, I, I guess I'll never qualify because I'll never stand in front of the class. No, no, that's not what he's saying. Are you, if, you, if your friend said, why aren't you, Gary Free, why are you a member of the Lord's Church? Why are you a member of the Lord's Church of Christ? I, I've heard some crazy things about you folks. Why are you a member of that, of that church? Gary says, I'm glad you asked that. You want to know what your Bible has to say? Well, I'm not that convicted. <laughs> you know, I'm not that interested. Or I might say, yeah, yeah. I would like to know. Tell me about it. And then, of course, he's going to sit down and tell me about it. Now, he might not ever get up in front of a Bible class and teach a Bible class. But he's perfectly capable and able and willing to sit down with one of his friends, neighbors, or relatives and say, read this. And opens up his Bible and points a verse and tells me to read it, and I read it out loud. That's Bible teaching. That's what we're talking about here. And there are people that refuse to do that. Well, I'm not qualified. How do you know? Now, I can see somebody saying, you know, I can't swim. Have you ever gotten in the water? <laughs> no. Why? Because I, I can't. I'm not getting in the water to learn how to swim. Hmm. It doesn't work that way. You've got to get wet. All right? Learn how to swim. You've got to start, you gotta start teaching. I've, I've looked back on some of my first sermons. <laughs> I got about 32 years of sermons back there. It's a fire trap, but... And I looked at the, I feel like I should go back and apologize to brethren. I mean, man, it's just amazing. But anyway, and you know, you, you, you get better. One of these days you're going to make a good preacher? Okay, that kind of thing. So, how is sin and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life overcome? How do you do that? Specifically, how do you do that? What's, give me, you know, really, I'm saying, I'm saying this. Give me step number one. Tell me what I, what's the first thing I have to do. Then what's the second thing? You know, too many, too many instruction booklets when you, when you buy something at Walmart or wherever you buy it. Someone like, you open up the instruction booklet and it assumes you know what they're talking about. The guy that wrote those instructions, oh, well, I know exactly what I need to say. But I, but I get that book, and I have no idea what he's talking about. Okay, you know, don't you write it for you. Write it for me that's never owned one of these things before. Okay, that's the intent here. Through the gospel that is sown in the heart, behold, a sower went forth to seed, sow the seed. The seed is the word of God, Luke 8 and verse 11. And when that seed is sown in the heart, when, that, when the person, when that that heart is exposed, the, the, the emotional, intellectual side of man is exposed to the truth, recognizes value when they see it or hear it, and says, you know what? That's interesting. I want to know more about that. Now, I might have heard Gary over, you know, talking to, to his wife about some biblical principle, and I say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm interested. Well, stop. Go back and say that again. I, I I'm, didn't mean to. To, to eavesdrop, but you said so and so, and Gary says, "Well, you're standing in line at Walmart," and Gary says, "Well, okay. Well, here's what I'm talking about. Here's the verses." And I stand there and think a minute. I said, "Well, could you take some time and teach me some more about that? I've been thinking about that very same thing." Or somebody's asked me about that. It's really got me thinking about it. And Gary says, "No, I'm not interested in teaching that." No, Gary's going, "Sure. What are you doing Thursday night at 6:05?" Now, if he said Thursday night at six o'clock. You all forget that, but he said 6.05. Why did he say 6.05? So I'd think about it. So I got an appointment at 6.05 to study the Bible with Gary Free. 
So, so that's how this thing works. The seed is sown. And then when it is understood, John 6, 44 and 45, they shall all be taught of God. Jesus said, he that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. Why do I need to learn about the Father to come to Jesus? Because it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God unprepared to meet him. And if I go to God through Jesus, that implies that I am now in a condition, in a purified, sanctified position, to stand in the presence of a living God without fear. Not saying we wouldn't be nervous standing there. I think you should be. But the idea is you're glad to be there in the first place. And then that word is obeyed. Mark 16, 16, the Lord said, He that believeth, after he's been taught, and is baptized, shall be saved. Well, it says, but it doesn't say, but he that believeth not is not baptized, doesn't need to. The non believer is not going to get wet. Why would, why would a non believer get in the baptistry tank? Why would he get in water over his head enough to, to bury him in water? Why would he do that? Well, it's not, I don't think I have to do that. Then he's not going to do it. He's not been convinced of the truth. A lot of folks like that out there. Uh, again, Romans chapter 6, 16 through 18. His servants are to whom you obey. You can become a servant of righteousness if you choose to. It's a choice. You listen to the truth. You weigh that thing in the balance and you say, yep, the benefits of obedience to the truth is better for me than just doing what I want to do here and now. And all this is going to be destroyed when Christ comes again in flaming fire. So, upon obedience, when I've sat down and Gary has walked me through the process of what it means to be a human being without God in my life, do I commit the sins, and all the process that goes along with that. And we finally get down, and he shows me the plan of salvation, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, the words of Jesus. And I look at that, and I say, you know what? I, I can do that. That's something I can do. And then I obey the gospel, knowing what that implies, because there's more, obviously more teaching. My sins are washed away. All right, now let's follow this thing. Acts 22, 16. Ananias, is, this, is, this is Paul recounting what happened to him on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 9. And when he got to Damascus, later on, Ananias comes to him and says, Brother Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, of course, Paul will be there. You go back and read the account yourself. But this is what Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, now that's the process. And somebody said, well, you people believe in water salvation. Oh, no, we don't. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, those that baptize infants believe in water salvation. I don't. The Bible nowhere teaches that. The, the, the water in the baptistry tank isn't the substance that forgives my sins. That's simply the process to get to where the blood is. And Hebrews 10 and verse 22, the author writing to, Jew, to Jewish Christians that understood the law of Moses and understood what the sprinkling of purification was, was were told the sprinkling, uh, the, the sprinkling of a clear conscience. So they understood, and as a matter of fact, if you read Hebrews chapters 9 and 10, it refers back to Exodus and Deuteronomy where the laws of purification and sanctification, sprinkling of the blood of the lamb and everything... Go back and read the last uh, four or five chapters of Exodus, about the first eight to ten chapters of Leviticus, and you'll see Paul, Paul, Moses, ere Paul, Moses, erecting the tabernacle after it's all been all this stuff has been gathered together. He puts it together, resurrects it, res erects it, puts all of the 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 uh, uh, furniture and instruments into the tabernacle, and then goes through the process, and he, and he takes the blood of the lamb and oil, and he sprinkles the, the tabernacle. He sprinkles all the instruments. He sprinkles all the people. He sprinkles the law itself. He purifies and sanctifies uh, Aaron and his sons to serve, and the Levites to serve in the tabernacle. So the Jew, the Jewish Christian, understood sprinkling. Now, it's not a literal sprinkling in Hebrews 10, 22. It's a spiritual application. But they got it. They understood what that, that process was. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 says that we, are, we have purified our souls in obedience to the Spirit. When we listen to what the Spirit has to say, Hebrews 8, verse 14, many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
and we do what the Spirit says. We obey from the heart that form of doctrine delivered. We're baptized in water to wash away our sins. And it's in the, but, but still, that's, this, that's not the substance. That's the process. The substance is the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 1 and verse 5. Jesus washed us from our sins in His blood. Revelation 7, 14. Those folks that John saw dressed in white linen, they purified themselves, they washed themselves in the blood of the Lamb. When did Jesus and they do that? When they were baptized for remission of sins. Now why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Not the water, it's during being in the water that one contacts the blood. How do you know? Because that's the only time we know about our sins being washed away. This verse tells us exactly precisely when and only when our sins are washed away for the non-child of God. It's when I'm baptized for remission of sins upon my confession of faith. That part of us that will stand in judgment, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, now has a plan of action to follow that ensures righteous conduct. Paul has said to Titus in Titus 2, now uh, the, the, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all mankind, teaching us words, teaching us, uh, uh, <laughs> interrupted myself, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How do I do that? By study of the Word of God and application to me. That's how I do that. When I find something that applies to me in the Bible, then that applies to me and I am to do it. Now, we don't build arcs. We don't sacrifice lambs because that doesn't apply to us. But when I read, that, I'm, that my, um, uh, like Colossians 4 and verse 6, let your speech be seasoned with salt. When I learn what that means, that means purified speech. Don't cuss. Don't, don't yell and scream at somebody in, in vile anger. That all my words are to, be, are, are, are to be pure and edifying. Then that means there's a whole lot of things I can't say anymore as a Christian, as a faithful Christian. And shouldn't even think them in the first place as far as that goes. It is through being led by the Spirit that righteousness is found and followed. Again, Romans 8 verse 14 as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Galatians 5, 22 through 26, the, uh, the uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So I need to find out what those things mean and apply those lessons to my life. 1 John 1, 7 talks about walking in the light as He is in the light. Okay, now, how do I do that? Well, Psalms chapter 119, 105 and 130, Thy word, thy word is a light into my path and a lamp unto my feet. Now, years ago, I heard a preacher preach on that, and, and I'd never heard this before. And I don't remember now where he got it, but he said that they had, back in Bible times, they had little clay lamps that they would strap to their feet and they, at, at night, and they'd walk along with those lamps lighting their pathway. Now, I'd never heard that before. I, I, and the way he said it, it wasn't a preacher story. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know. True or not, the fact is, is that the Word of God is a light into our path and a lamp into our feet that guides us how to walk. What should I do? What should I say? What should I think? How should I feel? All of that, he tells us all of that. All of that in great detail. We don't have to make it up or wonder. All we have to do is get out the Word of God and study it. I'd suggest a good topical reference Bible. Nave's Topical Reference Bible, the, uh, the Thompson Chain Reference is a, has some good stuff in the back of it. You know, we can talk about that at a later time. But, but that's how we do it. That's th this right here is how we overcome the flesh. Let, let him that stole steal no more. Uh, lie not one another, but speak the truth. So that means I can't tell you a lie anymore. I can't even leave out information. I have to tell you and be honest with you. Now, not... Well, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. No, you don't do that. That would not be appropriate. That would be unkind. Baby has some healthy lungs, doesn't he? <laughs> you can do See, you can do it. The pursuit of righteousness, of, excuse me, the pursuit of righteous behavior is a lifelong effort that ends only with our last breath. 
In other words, my whole life, in every aspect of my life, in every moment of my life, is governed by the Word of God. Colossians 3.17, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father. Where do the things that I, that I say and do flow from? As we said at the beginning of the lesson, uh, it, it flows from the heart. The bad things, the good things, all flow from the heart. What I have to do is change my heart. And this is how we do it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. That's how you do it. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. Study the book of Revelation. <laughs> that's, that's tough. But we can figure it out. Jesus said to hear, John 6, 44 and 45, they shall all be taught of God. Jesus said, I have to believe that he is the Messiah, John 8 and 24, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus said, we have to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, except you repent, ye shall likewise perish. Jesus said, we have to confess him before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, except you confess me before men. That's a, a, more than just a verbal affirmation, it's a lifestyle. I will not confess you before my heavenly Father. I need to, need to be baptized for the remission of my sins, Mark 16, 16. Now, Jesus, and you can, listen, you can disagree with the Lord if you want to. I, I don't recommend it. But Jesus said, the King James Version, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or is condemned already. Shall be damned is the King James Version. He that believeth not is damned, is condemned. And then finally, Jesus said in, in, in Revelation uh, Two and verse ten: Be thou faithful unto death, and I give unto thee the crown of life. Now, if you understand what that means, if you understand that the crown of life is an eternity in heaven, with God and His angels, and all the faithful that have gone before us, then then you've got a, a handle on on how you should be living your life. I'm hoping that this lesson has done at least two things. Number one, I hope it's at least confirmed the faithful. In their, in their travels through this life. And I hope, secondly, that it has brought questions to the minds of those that are seeking. The Bible has the answers. Let's sit down and study it together. We'll open up our Bibles and we'll look at the words together. We'll read the words out loud together. And we'll find out what God has to say to us through the words recorded in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-13. through 13. The words that are here are the mind of God revealed. That's a, huge, that's a huge deal. If you're not a child of God, become one. If you are, but you've been unfaithful, come back. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land.